Um, so next up, we are going to be hearing a talk on transforming healthcare with large language models, our favorite topic, certainly of Intelligent Health 2023. Um, and this is on solving real world challenges in clinical practice and patient engagement. So we can, can we have a huge round of applause for our next main, ooh, no, premature, premature, hold on, hold on, rewind. Maybe I'll do his name first and then I'll say a huge round of applause. I'll do his name first. <coughs> Uh, and our next speaker is Vajal Kocherman, who is the Head of Data Science uh, for Healthcare at the John Snow Labs. Can we have a huge round of applause for Vajal? Lady at the front, start it going, start it going, because you did so early. Go, go, go. Thank you. Thank you, Vajal. Hello, everyone. I hope I'm audible. So I was expecting to speak in a small room, so I'm a little bit excited right now to be on the main stage. So today, uh, we are trying to cover, I'm head of data science at Johnson Olds, which is a healthcare NLP company, mainly uh, globally uh, distributed around the world. So I am leading the data science team over there. So we have been working with NLP for the last five years over there, solving specific challenges in the healthcare. And today, I'm going to cover how we, what we uh, did with the LLMs for the last few months. And of course, we have been doing this for the last three years, especially. But now it's more popular, right? So let's start. So I'm trying to cover, uh, right? So to, I will start with the, like, a, like a general concepts and what is the trend and what we have learned so far. So to while applying, while deploying these solutions to solve certain problems on site. So as you know, there are tons of new large language models are uh, published, announced every day. Everyone is like competing each other, right? Pitting against each other, and then say they, they have some benchmarks that they try to evaluate each other, especially in the healthcare industry. So we have healthcare specific large language models as well, as you see. But as you know, ChatGPT is ruling the world right now. Llama 2 just jumped in, and then presumably, like in the next few months, there will be Llama 3, which is way better than GPT 4. But this is not going to end, right? There will always be better, stronger, larger. Uh, most ca more capable LLMs out there. But how you are going to deploy the solutions into your own prem to solve your own problem? Because you are not interested in how to cook certain recipe, right? So you, you need to solve certain problems in, with your own data uh, without dealing with any other restrictions or uh, air gap environment like of, how, like of high rule issues. So are you able to trust if you are using this kind of LLMs to solve your own problems, right? Because there's a concept called hallucination, as you know, which means that you may never know the information returned by LLMs, even, even from GPT-4, right? You may never trust the information that is returned by them. Of course, they are great automation tool. I use it every day, right? Even while preparing this presentation, I sometimes use it to, 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 fix, my, uh, to fix my phrases and then get some new ideas. But if I am trying to extract specific information, should I trust? Will I trust? Could I trust to LLMs? And the latest research says that, shows that even GPT-4, even with the like human feedback, reinforcement learning and human feedback, it is still not able to answer 40% of the questions correctly. So even with the default setting that most of you guys are using, you, the, more than half of the answers returned by LLMs even the most capable one out there, which people spend billions of dollars maybe, may not be able to answer half of the questions that you ask. It answers, of course, with a high probability, with a high confidence. It will say that, okay, I'm pretty sure that this, but for the information extraction, which is quite, which needs to be quite precise in healthcare settings, you may never trust, right? That's why we need to do something else, and people are working, like researchers are working on this, of course, lately. Whenever they release a new LLM, uh, especially in the healthcare domain, there are certain benchmarks like USMLE, like United States Medical License Board examinations, or some PubMed Q&A, or some MMLU, these kind of benchmarks, highly acclaimed benchmarks in the healthcare industry, but they are all research, right? So, because in the real world, we are not solving these kind of problems. We are not trying to answer questions given four options, like a multiple choice question. So, but right now, we tend to, people tend to, uh, evaluate their models. Of course, in academia, we need to share some benchmarks, right? And uh, we tend to accept the fact that, okay, these are the, these are the state of the art benchmarks, that if we are better in these domain, so we can safely ship. No, actually. Because uh, like GPT-4 right now, for example, 
presumably better than human to solve these problems. But human intelligence is more than this, right? So this showed the potential of LLMs to be used for simple tasks, like automating the task that is boring task, but leave you, let, let you spend more time on more uh, like intelligent heavy task as a physician, right? Uh, or as a data scientist, you can automate tons of stuff uh, with the LLMs, but when it comes to extracting information, there's a big bud over there. So I'm not the only one who's saying this, by the way, because large language models are the blue JPEG. You, you know, there's a JPEG format over there, right? It's, the, it's like a zipped, condensed uh, version of the image that you take a picture with your phone. So it's like a blue JPEG of the entire web which means that it's just try to represent the entire information it is trained on, right? So which means that you, you run a model for months over uh, trillions of text data, like a tokens, and then it tries to build the connection because it tries to squeeze all this information to, uh, to, to, represent the, to, to represent the facts. But it doesn't understand if it is fact or not, if it is reality or not. So, and then the uh, benchmark says that, when it comes to reasoning task, like automate this process, summarize this task, uh, or give me three token, three sentence summary of this text, or fill up this sheet, right? It's, it's doing really well, as you see on this venture. But when it comes to simple information extraction text, it is so bad. So you cannot extract, okay, give me all the oncological entities from text. It will return something, of course, but it, you will never be able to know that it, it returns all the entities that you would need. Why am I focusing on entities? Because there's still a big uh, misunderstanding over that, that LLMs can replace all these classical NLP techniques. I don't agree with this, which I'm going to show, because you still need these small, specific, uh, narrow models uh, to, to solve your problems. Because uh, using this on a UI chat UI is one thing, but to be able to integrate this into your own workflow, into your own product, is whole another thing that people uh, are going to struggle for the next few years, probably. So at Johnson Oblast, we have a library called Healthcare NLP that we ship like more than 2,000 healthcare models, pre-trained models, and then we evaluated like maybe 15 or 20 different entities against ChatGPT, and then as you see, uh, the like these pre-trained models, which are less than 15 megabyte, which means that this is just as small as 15 megabyte, is doing way better than 70 billion GPT-4, right, or GPT-3.4, or Llama-2, right, when it comes to extracting this kind of specific information. Okay, so this is one thing. Let's see the, the identification text, because when you want to share your data with the other colleagues, right, so other, other institution, you need, to, you need to abide by some rules, and then you need to extract you need to mask or obfuscate all the sensitive information from your, task, uh, from your text data, right? And then we did the same for ChatGPT, like finding all the sensitive information. And then we, we say that like half of the time, it is not able to detect all of them. So which means that if you have five sensitive information, it's, it's able to detect two of them. Uh, and it says that it, I've, I found all of them. So, so that's why for the identification task, you cannot trust this. Right now, people are using some in-house identification tools to share their data with some cloud-based LLMs. Of course, this, uh, it still works way better than LLM itself. So the challenges, we have just seven minutes right now, but I'm just going to get into the most important topics maybe, which I will try to make sure that, I try to make sure that you leave here with some new information. Uh, so risks and challenges, of course, LLMs are great to automate the boring stuff. It can uh, spare so much time for the physicians, uh, filling the forms, summarize the information, making calls, smart assistants, right? But it, it has big but over that, that there are some risks that people usually tend to ignore, right? So you cannot just trust whatever it returns, and you cannot just, uh, you cannot just ship it into your own prem. If you are a hospital, you have no idea about like a big GPU cluster that you cannot run 40 billion models on your own prem. Even if you want to communicate or make an API call to some cloud, cloud server, so you will have tons of regulatory issues that you need to deal with, right? So it's still, there are still key opportunities and key risks that people try to find a balance. So the most popular trends of LLM applications in the healthcare industry right now that I will just cover two of them. The first one is ChatGPT kind of UI experience. There is like there is even like a God mode 
uh, open source tools that you can ask one question and it returns answers from BART, Llama 2, uh, ChatGPT, Perplexity, this kind of LLMs, popular LLMs at the same time. Of course, you need to register, you need to uh, load your, uh, write your API key over there, and you ask one question and, and it returns answers from five different LLMs. This is one of the use cases people tend to use, but this is not going to solve your problem in the healthcare industry, right? Because you are trying to solve some real world problems with the data that you have that these models haven't seen yet. So now Rack comes to rescue. What is Rack? Retrieval Augmented Generation, they call it. Because it's designed to get over some limitations of LLM system. Because LLMs has like 50K or 40K context limit that you cannot dump into millions of documents into LLM right away and then ask questions. Even if you manage to do this, even if you manage to fit millions of documents at once in the ChatGPT UI, let's say, that will be like lost in the middle concept so that the LLM will not be able to understand what's happening between. Because it will, just like a human, it will try to return more information from the top and then the end of the data. So Rack, how does that work? Rack basically starts with the picking your documents and then embed them into a vector database. So there's an embedding stage over there, which is highly computationally expensive, but it's a one-time task. And then you write into a vector DB like Elasticsearch, Quadrant, Chroma, etc. And then you ask a question like, "What is what is fibric fibrosis? Like uh, cystic fibrosis?" And then you get an embedding of this, and then sent to vector DB. Vector DB returns five top five similar zip lists that is returned from your document, like millions of documents. It's like a KNN, and simple KNN. And, and then it just sent like construct this query. The query is respond to my question given the zip lists returned by vector DB. And then LLM just return one answer, which is basically saying that, okay, this document say this, and this PubMed article says this, and this is the answer. So, but there is a still a big but over that. This is highly popular, by the way. There is still a big but, because if you have one million documents over there, vector DB will return top five, top 10, and then LLM will construct an answer based on this top 10 documents. But you may never know if there's another top 10 documents which could answer your question way better because there's no human can digest all these 10 million documents to answer this question, right? That's why you may never know the top 10 results, top K results returned by vector DB is the one that you, your LLM would like to see. That's why there is some post filtering, post ranking strategies, even splitting strategies happening over there. So at Johnson, as we are working on this process right now, how to split or how to post filter your documents so that LLM can get the most useful information among millions of documents. So now we learned what real augmented generation is. And the next question is, since we have foundational LLMs that are tr trained on trillions of tokens, are they good enough or I can still work on smaller domain specific language models, can I? Yes, latest research says that smaller models to accomplish certain tests like name identity recognition, relation extraction, or summarization. If your job is to only summarize one information every day coming into your mailbox, or if your only job is to find the right patient cohort, or fill up some forms, it's this is your only job. Why would you need 70 billion model? You can just train, fine tune a smaller version of it, even less than one gig, which could even fit on your laptop or your cell phone, edge devices, right? Which could still accomplish way better than LLMs. We did this, by the way. We, 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 we wrote like eight different blog posts to explain how we run these tests. And then uh, there's even some papers to explain that small specialized models are performing way better than the large language models if you know what you are doing, if you have specific problems, right? So. Of course, you, the, the reason for that is that you have your own data, real-world data. And the model who has seen your data, even if it's small, it can answer way better than the other LLMs. I, I suppose you already took a picture because I will not able to cover all of them. So, uh, but Rack versus fine-tuning, because Rack is highly popular right now. Uh, you would prefer Rack or fine-tuning. Our experience with the customers so far shows that Rack is way better than most of the time Rack is enough, like retrieval, like, like dumping all your documents and then answering, asking LLM to answer this question based on the uh, similarities, right? 
So since I have only 40 seconds, I want to cover most important maybe, I'm sorry, this left the last minute. All this stuff that I explained so far cannot answer this question still. If you have millions of documents for 1,000 patients, let's say, for the last 10 years in your hospital, you cannot answer these questions with LLM or RAC. Why? Because there is no cross-referencing correlation between the documents in the RAC or LLMs. They are only taking a snapshot of that document or split, split through the vector representation. So that's why classic NLP methods comes into rescue, right? So what it does is that it takes a, we, we take your document or this application take, your, take the documents and then uh, parse with classical NLP techniques and then store into tabular data or or, or knowledge graphs, and then LLMs can s act like an interface to convert your query into SQL query, Cypher query, etc. So that LLMs, the maybe last sentence, LLMs shouldn't be used as an information extraction agent. It can be a smart assistant to orchestrate your task with the other smaller models in your workflow. And you could be able to do this on your prem if you reduce the size of the LLMs and then if you train on your own data, small LLMs. And we are going to ship a new product on-prem that you can just ship into your on-prem and then run with different LLMs. It will be generally available by the end of 2023. You will be able to do everything that I just explained today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vaisal. So we've got some time for questions. Um, so uh, as usual, stand up, name, where you're from. Straight away question over there. Thank you very much. I do love an awkward pregnant silence as well, so that, that, that saved me from it, but go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Maria Wong. I'm working at Novartis, uh, but used to be a physician. Um, this could be a cheeky question. Um, I really like your tool, and... Do you have any idea how this could be commercialized? Commercialized, as I, said, like, as I said, by the end of 2022, there will be an on-prem application that could be shipped into your on-prem. Of course, there are other companies also building similar tools. The idea, because LLMs, algorithms, they're all going to go away, and there will be new ones all the time. The idea is if you spend more time with your software teams, the all more tools to build softwares around these packages, these models, uh, you will have more models on your pram, and then it could be commercialized. Of course, you can go ahead and then buy from us, from the other companies, of course. But on prem, you could do the same on your own pram. So, because shipping, like the, mo the, the biggest pitfall with the LLMs, as far as I see, as a developer, as I see that, it's really easy to build POCs with LLMs. You, I, I can just convince my boss and my director, and then show that okay, this is working really well. I will just use ChatGPT under the hood. But when I try to build a product with LLM, it's whole another world that you need to deal with tons of issues. Even me, with all this experience, still struggling to tame all these models with putting some guardrails, scaling them, uh, making sure that they are always doing the right thing. So commercialized solutions is, yes, it's easy to buy and then start using. But on your program, with your own team, with your own solution, it will be way better, I guess. Does that answer your question? Not really. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to rephrase it. Um, so, you know, now we have this where we use the Google search, and then we have all the ads. You click a certain ads, and then the people who created those websites or whatever, they are going to um, be paid, get paid, or whatever, th those schemes that they have. So what I'm wondering is, so you are plugging in through the whole World Wide Web, and do you envision your system being a part of this internet commercial ecosystem? Is it enabled to do so to, in this kind of profit sharing? I don't think it can do it right now with its current capabilities just because of some technical limitations, and uh, especially in the healthcare domain. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't understand your question very well. Maybe we can talk after the break, okay? Please come find me. We have a boot over there, John Snow last boot. Please come visit. I can talk more about all this stuff, which I can talk for hours. Sorry again. Not at all. Amazing. And um, that's all we have time for because we're going to move on to the panel. But thank you so much, Faisal, for thank a you. wonderful talk. Round of applause for Faisal.